some startups fail in their first year, it is terrible that none of those employees would be financially compensated for their work and their labour under a system of share ownership in exchange for lower wages. Three main issues in this debate today. Firstly, why employees cannot consent to like opting into this deal. Secondly, why it's bad for employees financially. And finally, why it is bad for employees' health and workplace culture within startups. On the first issue of like why employees can't actually consent to this, we like to like characterise the type of startup that is likely to offer this deal. The type of startup that is going to be offering this deal is the type of startup that often doesn't have enough funds to actually pay for wages or like higher risk. The reason for that was is if if a startup is has enough funds to pay for wages, they are unlikely to choose to give willingly choose to give shares and therefore cede control or ownership of that company to their employees. And secondly, if that's if a startup is very confident of their success, they are the person who control that startup is more likely to cop short term losses in terms of wages and like reap the huge benefits of future profits. For those reasons, we think that the only type the types of startups offering these kinds of deals are necessarily startups that are underfunded and are very high risk. But even if startups are like likely to be super successful, which is statistically and also logically untrue, the comparative is, is companies can, like startups can still promise rewards for the success of that startup in the form of like yearly bonuses to employees. We think that those incentives those still exist for companies that for startups that are likely to be successful. Why then, given this like characterization of the type of startup offering this, is it impossible for employees to actually consent? There are three main reasons for this. Firstly, there was actually no meaningful choice because for a lot of these startups, it was either this deal or like you don't get employed by us at all because we have no means of paying for you and compensating you for your labour. What that means is that employees are coerced into either like share ownership deal where they maybe like get some money or like no money at all. We think that was an extremely coercive deal and like choice to offer to employees. But secondly, employees don't have enough information about the likelihood or extent of success. There are a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, because you just didn't know how successful your startup was going to be. You didn't know, um, even if you knew that it might not fail, you didn't know how much money it was going to make and whether that was going to make your the losses you cut in terms of your wages worth it. But secondly, the amount, the information you were going to get about the success of the startup was going to necessarily come from the person trying to employ you. That, that person in a startup that is underfunded is going to oversell the likelihood of success and like the amounts of like money that that company is going to be making in the future because they're desperate for employees. But finally, employees have like, um, as to why there's no information, in, these employees often have little like investment like understanding or investment knowledge, that means that they are likely to buy into these like really optimistic sales pitches from these employers and these startups. For these reasons, we think that um, that is a huge issue in terms of consent. But finally, the, the final reason why employees cannot consent is because the confirmation bias of your own success and how it ties into company success is especially strong in startups. Because startup culture is one where it's like, you do your own work and then the company succeeds as a result. So what that means is employees will think, I can do a good job of this and therefore I will like reap the rewards when this is untrue because there are many other factors which I will later go into which contribute to the success of a startup that are completely unrelated to that employee. So for these reasons, because there's firstly no meaningful choice, but secondly you can't like be informed about the decision you're making, and also because you are often coerced as an employee of these startups by your own confirmation and optimism bias, it is impossible for employees to consent to such a deal. For these reasons, it is unethical for companies, for startups, to offer them. But the second issue it is bad for employees financially. But um, for like four main reasons. Firstly, the cost of stable wages is something that you necessarily have to cop as a result of this deal. That means you initially you lose a lot of money and financial stability in the short term that can only come from wages and not the promise of some possible reward, even if that reward exists in the short term, you lose out financially. Um, especially if the company is so poor that it cannot afford to pay those wages, it is also further unlikely that that reward is going to be particularly high or that reward is going to exist at all. That brings up to the second issue of why it's bad financially, and that's because there's a high chance of the reward being like disappointing or non-existent at all. That is because, as I told you in my introduction, most startups fail. And this has, there are two main reasons for that. Firstly, market volatility, to which startups were particularly vulnerable, um, um, 
For example, the trade war between America and China that has massively affected the share market, and any effect on the share market necessarily play out have worse effects on smaller businesses of which startups are part. But secondly, like startups are often very vulnerable to like images of like business people within that startup. For example, if the CEO goes and sexually assaults someone, the startup, the shares price of that startup immediately drops. So the shares that you have just been offered are no longer valuable or like particularly meaningful. So for these reasons, it is likely that the chance of reward, um, that the reward is going to be very disappointing. But even when like these startups, you know, these startups don't completely like fail. They are often likely to not be extremely successful, like the pipe dream of like you ending up like the next Apple. I mean, they're often these just end up being like pretty mediocre, like sort of businesses, small businesses. And what happens is the problem with that is that people can't actually rationalise the amount that they the, the cost of their wages when they receive a dividend. They're like, oh hey, this is like entirely me. I got this dividend from my work. It is really hard to rationalise the fact that maybe that dividend was not enough to cover the cost of all the wages you lost out on over the years. So that is extremely problematic because people continue to buy into this sort of system, and that means that they will never they lose out in the long term from a huge amount of financial benefits. Um, and we think the final reason why there is likely these startups fail actually is also because startups are privately owned and not publicly listed, so it's harder to sell shares and get that funding for the startup to actually succeed. Um, that means there is no access for the general public to buy these shares, and the share market is often, often limited in these cases. Thirdly, I think it's impossible to know what value you're getting as companies can screw with share values. For example, they can make new shares which dilute your share values, which means that you lose all the money you were promised, and they can do that at any time noticeably. And finally, it's pretty dangerous to invest in one company. We'd rather people if you got wages and invest in a diverse portfolio that was better for their stability, financial stability in the long run. So this is why it was terribly bad for employees financially in the short and the long term. But finally, it's also bad for employees' health because, firstly, if employees put huge pressure on themselves because their livelihood is now entirely dependent on their workplace performance. But it was especially worse because, in many cases, their performance was not, not actually as influential on business success as, like, um, as they think. Like, for example, it's more probably more dependent on like marketing or like funding decisions by the higher ups, which means that the that employees push themselves to achieve really impossible standards. They push themselves to make up for the mistakes of other people within that company in a way that doesn't really exist when you have wages and you have that guarantee of pay there. But secondly, it was extremely harmful because not only was that employee putting pressure on themselves, but the company often used the startup company often used that rhetoric of like you you are directly responsible for your own like livelihood and the success of this company to like put these employees into like really like terrible working conditions. It was very easy to convince someone to work overtime for like very little compensation when you were like the, your your future success and your future financial compensation is dependent on how well you do and how much work you do now. We think this is why in like startup companies that are particularly high risk, there was often a very dangerous culture of the types of working conditions employees were subject to. So when we have these kinds of deals, employees necessarily not only are financially worse off, but have a worse time like working under these startups. They are more likely to be put into unhealthy working conditions. They are more likely to be stressed and pressured and mentally like just screwed over by such by these startups. So for these reasons, we think that you firstly cannot, so in summary, you firstly cannot consent to such a deal. Secondly, employees are financially screwed over. And finally, employees in the duration that they work for that startup are like mentally and like physically screwed over in terms of their health. For these reasons, we are proud to affirm. To be clear, that speech seemed like an argument for banning startups. Yes, startups are volatile, and maybe the fact that your shares could be worth nothing would influence you to press yourself, but presumably the fact that the company could just completely fold and you have no wage at all would, presume, would put the same coercive power on you. Secondly, presumably startups are likely to upsell you the success of their startup regardless of whether you have shares in that or not. That doesn't change under, under their world, but startups are definitely pressured and lose options for how they can obtain workers who are invested in their company when you restrict them to only one form of gaining employees, and that is to offer them monetary compensation in the form of a salary in any case. Let me be very clear what this negative team supports. 
We don't support startups being able to just not pay people at all and only give them shares. In fact, the info slide says, in exchange for lower wages, presumably those are wages that are regulated, for example, by a minimum wage or wages that are regulated by fair work, etc. So we would stand by that, which means that obviously the state has already made a judgment about whether or not somebody is being coerced to accept the minimum wage. They set that at what they believe is the acceptable like compensation at minimum you're able to receive. So that argument about uh, coercive wages doesn't make sense under, under the characterization of reality. Three things in this speech. Firstly, on coercion. Are workers able to consent to this risk? The first thing they tell you is that it is too risky to predict what might happen if you enter this startup. The fact that they can start their speech by saying, you know that 90% of startups fail, seems like common knowledge to me. Seems like common knowledge, particularly to someone who is interested in working in the startup space. But why do they sign up for that risk anyway? Because they compare that to a very predictable, often boring, often exploitative career at the hands of some giant mega company that they're not particularly passionate about the work for, and they don't care about. So coercion in capitalism obviously exists on both sides, but maybe you have an opportunity to do something exciting, and I think you can factor in that maybe the company would fail. Then they say, and this is contradictory I think in their case, you know, we would support startups having, uh, being able to promise you like a yearly bonus, Presumably that is the exact same as the prospective value of shares, but even less likely to happen because it's a lot harder to, uh, it's, it's much easier to determine, like, if you're like, I have these shares I got from when I was employed, a, a boss could easily just be like, sorry, we don't have enough money for big salaries this year, for big bonuses. Secondly, they tell you that they're likely to upsell you a risk, uh, downsell the risk and upsell you their dream. I think that happens in either side. But thirdly, they say, look, the circumstances of the economy change, and so you can't sign up to having shares in a company because you don't really know what's going to happen. A CEO could sexually assault someone. All right, well, that seems like something that could happen to every startup and is an argument for not allowing, for, for not working for anyone in your life. Obviously, people can't all just be self-employed. Yes, economies change and risks change, but that is something we think that you can like factor into your decision to work for a startup anyway. Then what we add substantively to this issue of coercion is what can startups offer if not shares, right? So if we adopt this model, they're no longer allowed to compensate for the shares, what, what do they have? They don't get more money just from this model being implemented. It's not like suddenly they have more capital to offer everyone extremely high wages. So it seems to me like you're literally choosing between the same salary on either side, but shares that might have prospective value on the negative team, or just the salary on the affirmative team. Obviously one has more value because prospectively it could be worth more, So and the salary is the same in either side. But secondly, and this is an important question in this debate, how do startups alternatively gain capital? Obviously if all startups could just be rich, they would, it's just not really a choice for startups. They can do two things. One, they can just choose not to enter the startup space. They don't have enough money. That's what will happen if they don't see any viable pathway to obtaining employees. Obviously, the prospective value of their company is akin to having some capital in the bank in the future. But secondly, they can just try and seek out venture capitalism, and that is far less preferable. Why is that? Because venture capitalists will demand a much larger control and stake in that company, and will demand that much of the revenue that is generated by that company is paid out to, to the shareholders, i.e. them as opposed to being reinvested in that startup. And that often is one of the major reasons why startups fail, because they sell their soul to venture capitalists to get off the ground, but then those venture capitalists demand they either sell that startup or that they stop paying their employees as much or they're no longer interested in that project and use their disproportionate power to stop them from being able to execute their vision. And as a result, those startups achieve less than they otherwise would have liked. <laughs> lastly, though, oh, lastly, though, they say, Companies can mess with shares. They can create more shares and therefore diluting your proportion. That's just not how shares work. If I have 5% of the shares of a company and they double the amount of shares they have, you still have 5%, you just have twice as many. That doesn't, that, they can't dilute your share that way. And if they could, we'd say that should likely be illegal, but they can't because that's just the law and that, that's just not how it works. So at the end of that, Coercion is worse in a world in which startups have less choice about how to gain employees. But also, just saying that startups are risky will not win the affirmative team in this debate. That is obvious to everyone, especially those in the startup space. But it's certainly more coercive if those people just have to accept a lower salary and, and cannot even uh, take on this shares. Second argument in this speech is why workers benefit from this in ways that they just simply cannot in a world where this model doesn't exist. First and foremost, let's be very clear. Workers who opt into this model of employment are obviously sitting on a potential gold mine. That is to say that if you join a startup and they've given you share options, plus your salary that they would like likely have negotiated with whatever capital they might have, if that company succeeds, obviously you stand to profit a lot. 
if the company is only paying you a salary and that company then becomes a billion dollar company and you have no share invested in that company, they have no reason to give you any more than just your average salary or maybe a raise. But obviously if you have shares, they can't just take them off you or say they're, not, they're no longer yours. And in that way, I think workers sign up for potentially disruptive startups because they see massive potential potentially coming out of that company. So obviously for you, there is a much more reward to potentially be gained at the exact same risk as the affirmative team's world, which the startup could already fail or succeed, but they'll have to compensate you for its comparative success. Secondly though, it's really powerful for employees because the company has much bigger incentive to treat you better. If they really rip off their employees, the employees have voting rights associated with their shares. And say a startup, which is often less than 10 employees, has given away 30% of its, of its voting rights to its employees and they band together and say, hold on, we're being exploited. The company is obviously going to have an incentive to look after you in some way because obviously you can vote to change the structural operation of it. Fourthly though, oh, thirdly though, ah, uh, thirdly, we think that just even in the worst, in our best case scenario, I think, but still important. Say I'm starting a startup and I just wanted my mate to be able to work with me, right? But I couldn't offer him a salary or the salary I could offer him was minimum wage. One of the ways I could compensate him is to say, look, I'm gonna give you some shares as well. Maybe they're not worth anything now, but they could be. You are literally stopping people from doing that even if they know that even if they were signed up for it just as a passion project. So that's to say, often people engage with startups knowing they're risky, but they're invested in the work or willing to take on the risk compared to just continuing to work in the same old, same old, because all those risks are still present even in the conventional job market. Lastly, in this speech, I just want to emphasize why we are invested in startups succeeding. That is for two reasons. The first is that they offer a powerful form of innovation, and the second is that they are disruptive. As a result, obviously this debate is hinged on maximizing their effectiveness. If they are less able to gain an employee base, that is to say that you only offer them a salary that they could offer in either world, but never offer them a share of the pie in the future, then that is a much higher barrier to entry for a startup beginning in the first place. Additionally, what that means then is that more startups are likely to fail on their side because they're risking a lot more at the outset to get the same amount of capital to be able to run their business operations. So I think I've demonstrated why it is true that coercion will exist on both sides, but at least there is a benefit for taking that risk on our side. But additionally, the companies themselves benefit for, from it, and for that reason, we are proud to oppose. <laughs> I don't think that startups were the most sympathetic stakeholder in this debate. That is to say that a lot of them are the pipe dreams of rich people who've left their companies to try and see if they can do something fun. It's a lot of rich young people who think they have an awesome idea that will change the market. Most of them fail and I think importantly you ought not let employees be coerced by these people by suggesting that there's a potential for them to make heaps of money. When in reality what this does is it gets it loses the money and it means that the entire future and the stability is attached to the success of these businesses that they cannot guarantee. I think it wasn't just some form of coercion in capitalism, it was a huge amount of power and coercion and at some point you have to draw the line and say the companies ought not be allowed to do this. So what am I going to do in this speech? First of all, I'm going to reiterate why we do not think that they have the ability to consent to these schemes properly. Second of all, why we think this is terrible for employees and their stability. And third of all, how this affects startups uh, in the long term. So first of all, in terms of consent, let's note that I think basically their response to coercion was, well, literally the state has already determined that it's just not too coercive, so we should say that that's fine. I think this isn't a response that is to say that you have to say reasons as to why the state thinks that it is totally fine and not coercive to an extent. So you can't just say it's the status quo says it's fine, therefore we should allow them to do that. I think they need to do a bit more work there and be a bit more charitable. But second of all, they're like, well, there's coercion in capitalism to, like, to some extent anyway, so it's fine. Yes, maybe capitalism is coercive to some extent, and yes, there is coercion generally in society, but at some point in society, if you draw a line as to when something is far too coercive, that you don't have the ability to rationally weigh those things up. And we told you a bunch of reasons at first to suggest that this was a particularly coercive and pernicious reason. That's to say that we, even if we allow people to encourage them to work overtime and those sorts of things, and we allow employees to do some things, we also say there are some things that are particularly coercive. So you cannot make people work a over a certain amount of hours, particularly in certain sort of jobs, or we say you have to pay them a certain amount of money. All those things suggest that we say that employers have a huge amount of power and there should be some limit as to what they can do. 
And what if we tell you some reasons why it is particularly coercive and therefore it ought warrant us regulating it? Because I think they failed to hear these and respond to them. First of all, we said that people don't understand what they are properly opting into. That is to say that the nature of it is a tool to attract people to be uh, to work for your company, which means you inherently put a positive spin on it. And I know they'll probably say, well, they have to tell you the risks generally about it. And yes, they may be written there, but they're still going to overwhelmingly put it as a positive spin because it is essentially a marketing tool in order to attract people, right? The second thing we told you is that people often have optimism when it comes to startups. Literally the only response is, well, everyone knows startups fail. Yes, and that would probably then suggest that a lot of people shouldn't make startups, but they do. And that's because people have a bias which makes them think that their particular startup will be one of the 10%. So it isn't that people generally know startups fail. The fact is that often people don't think their particular startup will fail. And when they've met with probably a very convincing CEO, they can paint you their vision and tell you how great their company will be, then people are likely to enter into it with an extremely positive mindset. But third of all, we told you importantly, the information asymmetry was far too big in this particular situation that we ought ban it. That is to say that often these people who are take going into startups are people with very little investment experience, right? And often the only perception of this is, oh, well, rich people invest money, and therefore that's a ability for me to get rich. But they don't understand a lot of the bunch of factors in that about investments that make them likely to succeed or not. So that step, we told you that. The lack of information and understanding of this is particularly coercive. And therefore, we ought not allow it, and I think meets the threshold where it's far too coercive to allow. But moving on to the second issue, though, as to why we think this is bad for employees. The first thing we said was that it carries a huge amount of risk. That is to say, that it does come at the cost of lower wages. The only response to this was to be like, well, no, because, you know, they can't offer you, like, higher wages because, like, they don't have the money to do it. First of all, I think being a bit charitable here, the topic literally suggests that it is a trade-off for lower wages and lower entitlements. So I don't think you can necessarily just assert that. But two, yes, you can offer higher wages, right? But you can just hire less people, and that is probably good. A lot of these startups hire a massive amount of people, and it's one of the reasons that they fail, because they overly inflate the amount of liabilities they take on and the amount of staff they take on. It's probably good if they have force to help you hire people higher wages and hire less people. Like, these people are probably people who have particular skills in certain upcoming areas such as technology, they probably can find other jobs in other businesses and would rather they go there. But third of all, they're like, well, there's no incentive to increase wages generally. And I think, yes, there is. Because now if they can't offer these other schemes, they still have to compete with other potential companies and private companies they could go to. So they're likely to still have to like, offer this to compete and give people wages. So we think they probably would get higher wages. Why do we tell you this was better? Because these are really risky investments. That's say that they're not diversified and they're not listed, which means that there's no ready buyers. Often startups aren't listed. And that was really important because the point at which you get value out of having these shares is when there's ability to make it liquid and to sell it and get money from these things. But often they aren't and often you looked into them because by virtue of them being a startup, often it's highly regulated by the company itself whether you can sell those shares to different people or who you can sell them to. So often you can be quite trapped into these. Also, companies can issue new shares. They did like some weird like maths thing is to be like, no, because you still have 5%, etc. They change the value of individual shares and they can still affect the amount of money and they can still increase the amount of shares. So yes, it can absolutely alter the value of your, of your shares, even if it's just that sometimes people don't like when you create more shares, so it actually does devalue the business. Those sorts of things mean that actually, yes, it's risky and you're at the whims of the company itself. I want to note here that maybe we're like setting up companies as being often quite malicious in a lot of these instances. And I think importantly, the reason why that's important is that there's particularly companies that often are coercive, that are like do not understand the maths themselves and actually set up really bad deals for employees. If there are good companies that are likely to make money, we told you that there are alternatives they could do to incentivize companies, to incentivize employees. They could offer bonuses or even better, just offer an alternative management system in which you like help people invest in different portfolios, but do not invest it purely in one company because that is incredibly risky. At the end of this, we would prefer people have higher wages. That is the trade-off that the topic is set. And that's because a minimum wage is not a living wage. And we prefer people get the money they're entitled to rather than like actually just copying a small amount of wage, which is incredibly difficult. They said that having like this, you're still exposed to risk to some extent because you know your wages, could, like you can lose them if the company fails. We would still prefer a world in which you were able to have savings generally over the time you were at that company, rather than literally not having any money because it was completely tied up in the value of that and you only had a minimum wage to cover your general living costs and couldn't save. So, moving on to the next issue, because I think the only substantive really was that, well, this is really bad for startups. 
First of all, they're like, your thing is an argument for banning some apps generally. No, because the risk is not the same. The point here is that often all of your money is overwhelmingly tied to much the success, success of the company. We would prefer they have wages. But two, if we lose some startups, I just think that is probably good. A lot of startups are actually really bad, are, are likely uh, to fail, and they never really totally articulated why we need so many startups and why we all prioritize them as something that is particularly important in this debate. Because we, importantly, we think that, you know, you can probably just like, if you're as a company that's likely to be successful, you can get investment from elsewhere. That is to say, you can get private investment, you can get subsidies, you can get grants from different universities, etc. which means that if at the point you can't convince a private investor that it is a good idea, then it's probably the most worst companies and most coercive companies that are having to get their employees to take on this risk, but no one else who probably understands the investment investment is willing to invest in that company itself. Essentially, you're just allowing employees to subsidize like failing industries, but they're particularly vulnerable people that are funding this. They were like, um, venture capitalists though, is capitalism, capitalists though, are really bad because they have overwhelming control of the company. We should note here, this probably, this logic applies to, it is really coercive because startups have overwhelming control over the employees that they now own shares of, which I just think if we were doing a way out, I'd rather venture capitalists have overwhelming control to a rich guy who decided to start a startup, as opposed to startups having overwhelming control of very vulnerable employees that have all their money tied up in the success of the company. At the end of this, we thought it was extremely coercive, we not, uh, we not what allowed, but second of all, we didn't think that we all prioritize startups, so we're likely to fail anyway. Crowd to confirm. Either these workers are so unskilled, incompetent, and uneducated that they are vulnerable to manipulation by companies who just prop fake statistics to convince them that the shares will succeed, or they are the kind of highly skilled, competitive. Uh, com competitive workers in the labour market who are able to like leave that startup and go to a company for a higher salary. A side opposition cannot have it both ways. They need to decide whether these are the kind of intelligent workers who can actually make that decision and like are also argue for higher salaries, or are they really the kind of vulnerable people? Uh, they cannot have it on both sides. Okay, three questions in this speech. First, can employees consent to this? Second, what's good for workers? And finally, on the question of what's good for startups. On the first. I'm going to give you a bunch of reasons why you can consent, but let me quickly address the kind of four threats that they give you to the ability of these workers to agree to these con conditions. Note that if it is true that these employees could make that decision, we would empower them to make that trade-off uh, because we think that they are best in the they are in the best position to understand their own financial situation as well as their capacity to engage in that risk. Okay, on the first, they tell you that these people have no choice uh, because they are not skilled enough to like enter other workplaces or things like that. We think that we can prop things like minimum wage and existing regulations to say that they are in a position to make that choice because uh, in the worst case, they get the minimum wage, which note in Australia is the highest minimum wage in the world with an incredibly high level of labour market regulation. But let's also deal with who works in startups here. This is extremely important because we think that the kinds of stakeholders who are kind of employed by these uh, startups are largely university students or people who are like studying uh, to, in some capacity. We would say that they are kind of pre-educated or at least in the process of becoming quite educated. Additionally, we would say that now more than any other time in their life, they are in a position to take financial risks. We would say it is incredibly important that you give them the capacity and empower them to make that decision and trade off that risk for themselves because those students are in the position to know whether or not they can do that. But the next thing to say is that this is a calculated risk, which is to say that insofar as you agree to work for that company, you better than anyone else are able to tell whether or not those shares are likely to succeed. We think at the point at which you say, actually, these are going to fail, you're still empowered to leave, and you leave with an asset which still has some potential of improving in the future. The next thing to say is that even if we say uh, that these are like incredible, if we accept the, the characterization which we flip to at second affirmative, away from the kind of first affirmative, these people have no choice, and we say these are talented workers who can argue for higher wages, then we would say that actually they are probably more empowered than any other group to make that choice and enter into that financial situation. The next threat they give you to content is to say that, well, this company will lie to try and coerce you into agreeing into this, into agreeing to this. The first thing to say is that uh, the response I already gave about how if you work for the company, you better than anyone else can tell the situation for that, you are then empowered to leave. We would also say additionally, you can seek damages for that if that company has flat out lied to you to like, coerce you into this contract. You can obviously seek kind of legal recourse to that. 
Uh, the next thing that we hear is, well, actually, the reason that they're going to lie is because these companies that are offering these situations are so incredibly poor. Note that that is massively in tension with what we hear in the introduction of the second affirmative speech, which is to say that actually startups are all just the brain children of incredibly wealthy people who have nothing to do better to do with that time. We would say, if that is the characterization, then it is probably true that these companies have a lot to fall back on and can actually financially support their employees. We would say, if it is not true, and we take the characterization of first affirmative, in that these companies are incredibly poor and are likely to lie, we would still say, you can seek legal damages, you can kind of, you can make that judgment call, we would allow people to make that decision. The next reason, the next threat that we get to the internet uh, is their kind of confirmation, the arrogance of employees thinking, well, they'll just make it work and ensure that these shares succeed. A few responses. The first is to say, if you have your own neck in the game, you are less likely to kind of deal with your own arrogance and assume that you will be able to make it work in that situation. But the second thing to say is that we actually are able to point to the benefits that provides to that company when that individual actually has some kind of stake in it. You are far more likely to have successful startups and we point to massive social benefits of that, like disrupting monopolies and creating innovation. We think that is an incredibly good thing. We would say on the outside, the same benefit as, they, as, as we claim under theirs is that you can still leave that workplace and in fact you are leaving in a better, uh, better financially empowered position than, when, than on their side because you leave with assets which have the potential for improvement on our side. Under their side they have to leave with absolutely nothing because they were only paid a small salary. At the end of this it is clear that this was a choice and that more than anyone else the kinds of people who were entering into it were the best positioned to make that choice. On the second, what's good for workers. If this arrangement is far better than the counterfactual under affirmative, we clearly pull ahead here. So what is that counterfactual? We would say Australia has massive industrial relations and regulation. We have the highest minimum wage in the world. We have a variety of enforcement mechanisms. Those are quite well known as well. So we would say that people are readily able to access things like the Fair Work Ombudsman and various industrial relations tribunals. The next thing to say is that wages probably don't change under either side significantly. In that we accept, if we accept the characterization of first affirmative that these are incredibly cash-stricken companies, it's unlikely that they are offering the kind of competitive wages that they then flip to at second. But note that they are probably just then the same wages that you're offering under outside, which is minimum wage which you agree to in addition to those shares. So where the wages are not significantly different, we would say that we would prefer the option to get this extra financial empowerment in the form of those shares. We would say that that is a benefit that we can claim. Even if the wage is somewhat higher, and we say that, well, actually, maybe this is one of those startups which is just the brainchild of a really rich person, and they can pay $24 an hour instead of 18, we think that $6 an hour is not enough, particularly for a uni student, to say, well, you shouldn't even have the option to take ownership in a company, which may become like the next Snapchat or something, and you have the potential to have massive economic benefits. In that situation, we would say that we would prefer, uh, we would prefer our side, given that the harms and the difference between wages is not significant. On the question of financial risk, AF tells you that shares are particularly harmful and so you shouldn't be able to make that decision at all. They tell you this is because they're volatile. We would say that is in tension with their material about the harms of these being private shares in that you are not exposed to the same level of market volatility if these shares are not like actually publicly offered. But the next thing to say is that this extends to both sides because to the same extent that like, well, if the director of your company rapes someone, your shares go down in, in, you know, in, in, in price, it is also probably true that that forces the company to close and you lose your salaries and have no assets to fall back on, that is far worse. The next question is the question of wages, which I already addressed. Then this question of whether or not the company would dilute your shares or control them uh, to kind of limit the benefit that you get from that. We would say that's firstly not in the incentives of the company because they want you to work hard. It's also fairly obvious if they dilute your shares, you're probably going to be pretty unha unhappy at work and just leave. But the next thing is to say that we can also just fear that we would regulate this. We think that is the status quo. We're pretty sure that is the law. We can also regulate that to ensure that we protect the workers there. On the question of workplace culture, which kind of fell out of second, but I'm going to bring it back because I think it's terrible. Wind pushes these harms to workloads and pressure. We would say that is not exclusive to the to like outside, that is just a fact of working in a startup in that it is incredibly high pressure because it is make or break in the first two years. Those happen on both sides. At least we can prop the kind of economic benefit of having an asset, of having something in the game. We think that is a characterization of the culture generally. That doesn't change no matter what kind of contract you're on. At the end of that, it's clear that it's far better for workers when they can get some kind of economic benefit and the instability that they push is not exclusive to outside. Last question, what's good for startups? Why are startups inherently good? We say they break up kind of uh, they break up hegemony in the market. They are disruptive. They are innovative. They provide a lot of economic benefit and employment, particularly to young people. We would say that when you expose them to the kind of coercive natures of things like venture capitalists, that is incredibly harmful. The only response that we get a second is to say, well, 
if they are exposed to that coercion, it is probably because they are just a shit company. We would say actually a lot of startups have kind of charitable interests or want to give back to society, which means that venture capitalists don't have incentives to engage in negotiations or deals with them. So you provide them an alternative and a way to benefit their community and provide those charitable services on the outside when you don't have to go to those kind of venture capitalists and prove that you are somehow going to make a profit when in fact the purpose of your company is just to do something that is actually just beneficial to society. At the end of that, it is clear that we got more startups, that those startups were more likely to be successful because you gave incentives to workers to work particularly hard and ensure that they like did the best job in that company, but also that you are more likely to have startups that gave some kind of benefit to society. So proud to oppose. Let's be clear in this debate. The difference between the affirmative and negative teams is that under our side of the house, you can't choose to take lower wages in exchange for getting an uncertain investment in the company that you choose to work for. That means that under our side of the house, you have a base higher starting salary than you would under the negative team. That means at the point that company goes under, you have more money than you would in the scheme where you get paid less in the hope that those shares are gonna pay out at some point in the future. You necessarily take a much less risk. This negative team wants to hang their hat on things like the minimum wage existing, the minimum wage is very low, it's $21 an hour by comparison to something like $60 an hour on salary. That is a substantial difference. But importantly, even if that wasn't factually true, if you are a company offering shares to your employees in exchange for lower wages, it is likely to be much lower because that is the only time in which you have an incentive to offer them shares as opposed to paying them a higher wage to begin with because it is a cost saving mechanism that you are only likely to implement at the point you don't have other options the reason we give you in Winnie's speech. Three questions in this speech. Firstly, what do these startups actually look like in terms of when they offer them? Secondly, can people consent to this? And finally, what does this do for employees and for startups? Firstly, when do startups actually offer this to their employees and what type of startups are we talking about? We tell you two really important things in Win's speech that are defining of this debate but go unresponded to. The first of those is that companies are less likely to offer this arrangement to their shares when they perceive that they will be successful. And that is for two reasons. The first is that you have to cede, as is conceded by the negative team, some degree of management control to your employees because they are now shareholders. They potentially can appoint things like directors to your board. But secondly, you have to then give up a profit return that you would otherwise be able to claim for yourself when you allow shareholders to get dividends at the point that company succeeds. That means that you are unlikely to offer this deal to your employees if you actually foresee that you will be successful. It means it's an uncertain investment in the best case for this negative team. The second important thing that we tell you though is not only that you are unlikely to do it if your company is likely to be successful, it's that you're likely to only do it where you don't really have much of an option except to just employ less people. That's important in this debate because it means that the choice we're talking about in terms of whether or not you take is, is not a choice as is claimed to be characterized by the second negative speaker about like people being unintelligent and not being able to choose who they work for. It's a choice about having no meaningful option within the startup that you want to work at because they say it's this or nothing because otherwise you have to employ less people to pay other people more wages and you can't be one of those people that we do employ. That means there's no meaningful choice because you want to work for this company but you can't do so unless it is on their specific terms. That's the characterization you need to engage with as the negative team in this debate. That's what those startups look like. First issue then, why can't people consent in this debate? We tell you a number of things that go completely unresponded to. They say things like, well, either these people are intelligent or not, and so you have to choose which one they are, because that affects whether or not they can consent. Obviously, the logic here is that you can be a highly skilled person at technology. You can know heaps about biotech, you can know heaps about blockchain and how it works, but know nothing about the stock market because they are entirely different skill sets and entirely different areas of knowledge. That's important in this debate because you can still then be coerced even if you are highly intelligent. Like, that's not in tension with one another, that's called nuance. But secondly, in terms of they say, oh, well, this is particularly bad because like you do have a choice. I told you why the choice is within the company you want to work for, you don't have a meaningful choice about what options are available to you. So also, again, unresponsive. But the third thing we tell you that you didn't know what you were opting into and that was harmful. We told you that was for three reasons. Firstly, because there was a lack of information. Secondly, because it was hard to know the value of shares privately before they were listed on something like a public stock exchange. So it was necessarily an uncertain investment in addition to the fact you didn't know anything about the future of that company. But thirdly, the company could dilute your share value by issuing new shares. In response, they say, well, a lack of information or 
always exist because when you go to work for a startup, there's inherent risk and you get told by the CEO that it's going to go great. Obviously, the difference is the one I explained to you in my introduction, which is you at least have a much higher starting base salary. At the point the company does go under, it's less of a problem that you had a complete lack of information about certain elements because you have a salary to fall back on as opposed to a huge amount of money that is tied up in shares that you are unlikely to ever reap the profits of. Obviously, that's a difference. Secondly, on minimum wage, like... I just think that the assertion that like the minimum wage is fine is a lie. It's not a living wage. There is an important distinction to be drawn between those two things. I also think one reading of this debate like fairly implies that we would be abolishing private, we would be abolishing state government enterprise agreements in favour of allowing people to negotiate. Like I won't push that, but I don't think the burden that claims minimum wages continue to exist is necessarily fair. In response to like valuing shares or diluting the value of your shares, they say, well, that's against the law and there are limits on these things. The first thing to note is like it's obviously not against the law for companies to issue new shares. There are some restrictions that exist in the case of public companies, but as Kendall tells you in her speech, we're dealing with often private companies because they're much smaller and less well established. Those same restrictions necessarily don't apply. But secondly, they usually always apply to majority shareholders. You are unlikely to make an individual employee a majority shareholder in your company, so the same restrictions on your ability to dilute shares don't apply. The logic here is not you promise an employee 5% of your shares and it changes no matter how many shares you have. As you say, I will give you a thousand shares in the company and then you choose to issue another 100,000 so that becomes almost nothing by comparison. That's how companies work. Second question in this speech, what should this do for employees? I think that it's important that we get you a realistic comparison at first affirmative that is not responded to, which is that companies that genuinely have less money and would like to reward their employees should offer higher starting salaries to the extent that it is possible and then pay those people bonuses because they are certain they're going to reward people and they're not an unrisky financial investment for all the reasons Wynn gives you that go unresponded to. They don't get any response to this except to say it, Chris, well, there's no incentive to do that. The obvious incentive is that workers work better when they get bonuses. That is well known. It's why companies offer them. I think they're likely to do so anyway. Um, so secondly, then they say, oh, well, you miss out on the opportunity to get billions of dollars. I think we told you why the companies that are likely to offer this are the companies that are least likely to be making billions of dollars. And that problem is exemplified, though, in the second negative speech of speech when they say you lose the opportunity to invest in Snapchat because that's what you say to your employees, but you are not Snapchat. You are another failed app that doesn't go anywhere. But even if they did become really successful, let's be clear, you don't miss out on the opportunity to invest because you can still choose to buy shares in the company that you work for if you want to. The difference is this. Firstly, you have to pay with your own money up front for those shares, which causes you to think and reconsider your investment decision because it seems like more of a big deal if you have to outlay money at the front rather than just not being given something to which you otherwise might be entitled. That inherently seems more risky in the way it plays on people's bias. But secondly, you don't have to do it at the start of working for a company, right? So even if that's not true, it's like you become an employee and you accept this risk before you know really how the internal operation of that company operates. Under the alternative, you can work there for six months, see the company is going successfully and then choose to buy shares and profit off it. Like that seems like an infinitely better idea to me. And guess what? You can use your higher salary to pay for the very shares that they think it's so important that you can have a say in. What are the harms that we bring you on this? We told you it dilutes the value of your shares. You can't sell your shares because often they place conditions on it and you've invested in one company. We get literally no response to any of that material. In response to Wynn's claim that like this week's sort of like levels of pressure in these particular areas, they say, oh, that exists either way. Obviously, it's much greater if you don't have a base salary to fall back on that is higher than it otherwise would be under their side of the house, so that is worse. They say that you can sue. That's a flat out lie. Who are you going to sue if the company collapses because it lied to you about its prospects of success and it owes a bunch of money to creditors like no one? The difference is here you have a wage, you are a creditor, you are entitled to something. On startup culture, really briefly, they say, oh, and sometimes it would be good that charities would get money. Obviously, governments have huge amounts of incentives to invest in those kind of things because it relieves the social burden that they are required to satisfy. So even if private incentives are malicious actors who don't want to invest in things that are going to be good for people, the government has those incentives. Those things continue to exist anyway and the benefits are marginal. So proud of the
the opposition needed to be charitable in this debate. We weren't paying you nothing. You obviously still got a wage. The trade-off, therefore, in this debate was under the opposition side, you got a low wage for one year for most startups. Under our side, you get a marginally lower wage, but that comes with the potential to earn millions of dollars of revenue that you would not otherwise get. But moreover, our team side comes with a myriad of unique benefits, that is to say, employee dedication towards startups, more likely for serviceable startups and charitable startups to actively succeed. Therefore, the only thing the opposition can stand on is the fact that you're maybe getting paid $10 an hour higher under their side for one year in the case of most startups. That wasn't a benefit that could win them the debate. Obviously, we're still paying them a wage note as well. Minimum wage doesn't get abolished because we're continuing the status quo. That was a bizarre insertion of third. Three things I'm going to talk about in this debate. Firstly, could employees consent? Secondly, were shares uniquely bad? And thirdly, why this was good for startups broadly? Firstly, can employees actively consent? Three things to note here. I think the first thing to say is the opposition brought out the most bizarre counter model at first and then tried to run away from it. They said, well, you're just going to do things like yearly bonuses and increases. This undercuts all of the analysis that they provided because I think things like yearly bonuses are as predatory as they're claiming our things to be. That is to say, you could still get schmoozed by a compelling CEO who's just going to, instead of saying you're going to have 5% of the company, say your wage is going to exponentially increase year on year with the bonuses that we're going to give you. Predatory uh, uh, actions still existed under their side. But note as well that bonuses were uniquely worse, and this was their counter model under their side, because they were more volatile and amorphous. That is to say, under shares, you get 5% of shares in a company in the long term, whereas bonuses were dependent on things like inflation in the market broadly, dependent on things like other employees actively coming in so you could take things like longer leave. Moreover, though, if the opposition wanted to claim bonuses at the big counter model prop, I think we're better at getting employees bonuses because you have a unique bargaining power at the point at which you accrued voting rights in a company. That is to say, if you're giving 5% of a company, the CEO has an incentive to make sure you're treated relatively well, and therefore you're probably more likely to get things like bonuses in the long term. That is for the reason that if an, if an, employer, if an employer treats you badly as an employee, then they will like, um, if they treat you badly as an employee, you have voting rights in that company and thereafter try to oust the CEO in the long term. But moreover, because you have a stake in the company, you could still walk away from it and still accrue profit in the case that a startup actively succeeds. Second thing to note about consent is where is, uh, the opposition claim is that people can't comprehend the risks properly. Three responses to this. I think firstly, people can comprehend the risks and do know that 90% of startups fail and therefore approach startups with an element of caution. Second thing is just to characterise the types of people who actively join startups. That is typically done and relatively ambitious people. The alternative for those people is just working menial work anyway under a big tyrannical um, company which might be worse for them in the long term. The third thing to know about these people though was they're often high skilled individuals as the opposition said and they say well you're high skilled but you won't know a lot about the stock market broadly and therefore you'll be conned. But at the point that you're high skilled in tech or whatever your option is probably you're getting paid $30 an hour working for this startup under either side or whatever or you go to a bigger company where you're offered a bigger wage. You probably have an idea of where your value broadly is. You probably have access to things like advice and know when you're going to actually get ripped off. Third major thing under whether employees can consent or not was a bizarre concession that Kendall made saying that people could be doing other jobs at the point where people could be doing other jobs and are highly skilled. They probably made a voluntary choice that they want to join the startup even if they think the startup's practices aren't particularly good because they see the potential in that startup. But the fourth major thing to note about consent broadly is you had a unique bargaining power under our side because cash strapped startups this is how they characterise the debate at first, and these startups that we all care most about probably don't have a lot of leverage over you to the point that they have limited capital and can only pay you in things like stock options, and it's unlikely they're able to be particularly tyrannical towards you. That means they can't harm you broadly. Second major thing I want to talk about in this speech is were shares actively uniquely bad? Three things to talk about here. The first thing they talk about is that shares are volatile and can plummet if your boss gets done for sexual assault and other market factors. Firstly, this is contingent on those shares being public in the first place, which a lot of their arguments hinged on them not being. So that's um, a, a concession. Second thing to note here was this is just an argument for not working for anyone in any sector, startup or not. That is to say, your company can really go downhill if you're working in the private sector broadly. If your boss gets done for sexual assault, you can get laid off as a result of the reputational bad things that accrue to your company. But the third thing to note was the market is inherently volatile. You could get sacked from any job that you worked at. Moreover, you still get sacked under the opposition side at the point at which your startup fails after 
one year term. Second thing to note about whether shares were uniquely bad was the claim that they give, well, shares can be diluted at whim. Katie tries to save this sinking ship when she says, well, you're only given 10,000 shares. I think people aren't that stupid in this debate. You're probably given things out in percentages. If not, we mandate that you have to be given in percentages. I think the opposition need to be more charitable. You can't just dilute our shares at a whim without shareholder approval. If you do, you have recourse to things like that with the Fair Work Commission. 5% remains the same stake in the company overall, whether it represents 10,000 shares or 20,000 shares. But moreover, the, you can only actively dilute someone's shares at the point where they become profitable. And at the point where those shares have become profitable in the first instance, it is likely that your company has succeeded. And you've at least realised some of the benefits of joining that startup in the first instance. At the point where the harms the opposition start talking about actually accrue, the they, for one, don't occur due to the mechanisms we have in place. But secondly, when startups succeed, when you're already realising a lot of benefits, you only uniquely get on our side. The third major claim the opposition give us here is that shares are private and you can't sell them. Four responses to this. Firstly, if shares were private, you still earn the revenues that the, go that the company was making year by year. Secondly, you have recourse if your shares never went public and if you were promised that they probably would in the long term. Third thing to note though was, again, this only applied to successful startups. Most successful startups eventually had an incentive to go public because then they had more access to capital. At that point, you could sell your shares if you wanted out of that company, but you might not want it out at the point where the companies actually become profitable. But moreover, if the company has become profitable, which is when these trade-offs start to occur, internally, they would probably want to buy you out. They probably wouldn't want a passenger in their company who owns a 5% controlling stake, which is relatively large uh, in, in the long term. Therefore, shares weren't a uniquely bad thing. Final thing I want to talk about in this speech is why it was good for startups broadly. In context, I think we have to care about startups for a few reasons. Firstly, because they're disruptive, innovative, and they bring products to monopolised markets often, which is good in and of itself. But moreover, they often employ young people, which is beneficial. Kendall bizarrely claims that it was, well, just the pipe dreams of rich kids, but this heavily contests with the characterisation they themselves gave the first speaker, that it was typically cash-strapped companies that we were concerned with. Uh, two things to note here. Firstly, employees have vested interests in the success of companies at the point in which they have a controlling stake in them to an extent. They say well, this results in overconfidence and an optimism bias, but I think in the context of startups uniquely, employers probably did need some element of overconfidence for those startups to actively succeed. In some areas, that could actually be beneficial. But the second thing to note was you're less likely to fail at the point where the employers needed to see the company do well to actually realise financial benefits, that then those startups are going to be better in the long term. Second thing to note was that the opposition kind of just bluntly assert that startups have other options, and there's two main options that startups have. Firstly, they just say, well, you can just pay people more, but most startups literally cannot pay people more, especially the ones we care about who are doing this. Katie concedes this point at the point where she says, oh, well, startups probably don't want to give over a controlling stake they have in their company because they themselves will see their company as valuable and only want to pay wages. But the opposition's only mechanism, therefore, that stands up is in a context where startups are only established to fail in the first instance. If you think your startup is going to succeed, you're not going to want to give away huge controlling stakes in it. That's beneficial. Moreover, um, oh, yeah, yeah. Second thing to note is just that they say, well, you can just get venture capital. And, well, if you can't convince venture capitalists, you're clearly not proposing a good product anyways, but you didn't want to send your brainchild to the vultures who demanded 60% and also demanded you maximise returns. A lot of startups were charitable in nature or service-based. Insofar as that was the case, the only options for them was probably to give out low controlling stakes to mates, which was often what startups actively looked like. At the end of this debate, then, startups were more benefited under our side. Moreover, employees were more than capable of consenting to these things. And in the end, the opposition's counter model is as harmful as anything that they claim ours to be. We should obviously... Uh, so, obviously negatives on this debate. Thank you. Is it already recording? Ah, oh, sure. On the first question of consent, I think the important and correct way to phrase this clash is, can anyone who can choose to sign up to a startup not choose to take shares in exchange for a small part of their salary? Because obviously this affirmative team were happy for people to consent to the risk of working in a startup, the pressure of working in a startup, the volatility that comes with that startup potentially being tied to the actions of its boss. The question becomes then, why is it inappropriate for people to trade away a part of their salary for these stocks? Here is what they say. The major benefit they try and claim is that at least if a company folds, you have savings up until that point because your starting wage is higher and so in the meantime, before it fails, you get more money. 
But it's important to like, take into account three things, and that's and those three things prove negative means of splash. The first is to say that that marginal increase of say ten or fifteen thousand dollars comes at the massive expense of potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue should those shares become valuable. But the second thing is not a mathematical question, it's just to say, who is the affirmative team to decide for those individual people that that is a choice they cannot make? We tell you that there is common knowledge of the risk of startups, we additionally tell you that those employees are more invested in the success of that startup, and additionally we tell you that those employees are the kinds of people that we believe, yes, according to Kendall's characterization, do have niche skills and would have alternative options, but have otherwise chosen to work for a startup because they find it more fulfilling, or because they believe they can add more value to that company. What they say, and using their own language, is so what if some startups fail, and so what if some startups have to employ fewer people? Well, those statements have very important implications for this debate. Because if they have to offer people higher salaries and employ fewer people, presumably their benefits also accrue to fewer people. Because if you have to pay one person more at the expense of hiring someone else, then they are obviously benefiting a much more niche number of individuals. But secondly, and this is also important, this is also important on this issue. If startups fail, then they obviously are trading off the capacity for startups to innovate. Often the large benefit which we provide you in this debate is that yes, while startups don't always succeed, the chance that one does has the capacity to change the industry, and that is a benefit we all facilitate, and we give that to you across, uh, across the bench. So, it's unclear why these people are smart enough to opt into one risk that the opposition is happy with, but not smart enough for this other risk, which has a track record of also providing benefit to individuals, and does play off their capacity to get jobs elsewhere should they choose to. So obviously individuals, we believe, can consent to this arrangement, but to the extent that they can't, they likely couldn't be able to consent to startups at all, and unfortunately the opposition picked a very sticky, contradictory point to stick at in this debate, and were unable to sell us on that. So, the next question that comes to this is, okay, what happens to startups if they can only offer wages, and we will deal with both conceptions of startups at end of the day. Let's start with the strapped up startups. We, I think, say that the majority of startups are likely to face capital limitations for reasons that both the affirmative and negative team give you. They are new, they are trying to invade a market space that is hostile to them. Additionally, a lot of them are started by people out of passion and not necessarily people who are uh, in immediately in a place to uh, make a profit. What happens with those people, those startups, is first of all, either they don't open because they can't afford to, trading off all of the benefits that disproportionately affect particularly charitable ones that are less likely to develop a lot of profit over time, or secondly, they resort to venture capitalism, which would give you structural reasons to just undermine the efficacy of startups in the long term. For example, they have to seek more control, and those venture capitalists are more likely to operate against their interests because they want to shut them down. On the rich startups, though, they say, well, look, if a lot of startups are rich, they can afford to offer people higher salaries in the first place, ignoring their own rhetoric that they give you, which is to say that obviously you want to attract the best employees, so you want to provide the best terms at the original point uh, of negotiation, which suggests that they're likely to do that anyway. But secondly, also has the unfortunate consequence of this affirmative team of minimizing their risk of having no access to recourse if the company fails. Because presumably, if they started by rich individuals, those are the people you sue if they lie to you, which also feeds into our consent analysis, which says that you are likely to be able to consent or seek recourse if you're lied to. So, at the end of this, these people who are opting into these startups obviously have a number of options on the table. Opt into this particular arrangement because they see a value in it, and we are happy to let them see that value if they want to make it uh, materialize as reality. But additionally, fewer startups or startups with fewer people that are financially less successful will be operating in this affirmative world, and for those reasons, we want to play. their rhetoric, so I want to be clear in my introduction. This isn't about forgoing an extra $15 an hour for a few years to then make thousands or millions later. What you're doing is giving up quite a significant amount of money, which is $15 an hour if we go up sort of their numbers, for a 1 in 10 chance of making those thousands or millions of dollars later. Therefore, what you need to remember in this debate is our very real harm of a lot of people having their money tied up in these assets and then losing it later will accrue to nine out of 10 of these people. So that harm exists in either side of this debate, oh, on their side of the debate, and should not be ignored because it is a huge harm to the vast majority of people in this debate. So what am I gonna look at? One, consent. Two, why we think this is better for employees. And third of all, why we think uh, how this will affect startups. So first of all, in terms of consent, they said that coercion to some extent exists generally in all areas, so it is fine. 
I think yes, coercion exists to some extent, but we told you structural reasons why this one was particularly bad and we ought to regulate it out. Things such as a lack of information, but also even if they have some information they said, we told you it was skewed hugely by the optimism bias that yours would be the startup that would have failed despite nine out of 10 failing. But third of all, we thought it also carried incredible risk. That is to say, some of these startups will definitely fail and they cannot shy away from that. So for nine out of 10 of those employees, we thought they could not consent because the harm was so large that they did not comprehend it and bought into these huge harms. They probably would regret incredibly later that we ought to regulate it out. So then we're looking at the second issue, why we think this was particularly harmful for employees that we ought not allow it. So first of all, they said it was safe because you would have an asset. And second of all, you would have the chance to make heaps of money. I want to be clear that we thought this was quite incredibly abstract throughout this debate and was contingent on the success of that startup. So in nine out of those 10 times, they could not guarantee that this benefit would accrue to those employees. That was to say that we told you that often these companies are listed which they, because they're small startups, which meant that there was a limited ability to sell. So the value of those assets could not accrue in a lot of these instances if you were not able to sell them. But second of all, when they leave that company, they're probably at a point where those assets are not worth it. That meant there was no benefit to that asset for nine out of 10 of those people they were talking about. Therefore, what they were left with on our side was a tangible, like literal initial loss of higher wages that could have accrued to those people. And we all had value and the negative cannot escape that. That is an immediate tangible loss that happened on our side. The other thing also we told you was that just a massive amount of these companies will fail, which is a massive amount of risk to have your money tied up in the success of that company. You cannot get that money back compared to what we told you on our side was the savings you can accrue from those higher wages because $15 an hour for a few years was a huge amount of money to have lost. Therefore on our side, a living wage was infinitely better because we told you it gave you the money you needed to be stable in the long term if those companies did potentially fail. It did cover you from risk comparatively. But two, Katie also told you you can invest later privately in those companies from those higher wages if that was something you wanted to do. So people were always in a better position on our side. It was incredibly far more clear on our side the harms would accrue to these individuals if we allowed them to enter these risks. We should override their consent if, 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 if this harm accrued. The final issue in this debate was whether how this affected startups. They like we should care because they are good. We told you we should care about some, but there were also some that were probably bad that were just the pipe dreams of people and we ought not protect them in all instances. So we conceded that some might not succeed, but that was probably a good thing. We told you that if those companies could not convince private investors, could not convince governments, and could not convince universities to invest in their companies, then they probably should not be allowed to, to, to uh, sort of get money off the most vulnerable people to make, which were those employees that signed up. They should not take on that risk. But finally, we told you it was likely that not all startups were going to some, suddenly abandon, be abandoned on our side, because all we said was that it forced them to not take on employees as liabilities. That is, that they were probably hire less people, which meant startups could still succeed where they probably would likely succeed, but they would not take on a huge amount of people in order to give them higher wages. At the end of that, we thought people could not consent, it was hard for employees, and it only got rid of the worst startups we all don't support anyway, crowdsourcing them.